come to the stage, but first uh, we have um, this one. First we have uh, Jonathan Gray, who is uh, joining us via video call. Um, so I just want to make a, a quick introduction uh, for the panel and the panelists. Uh, so uh, our panel is called Reimagining Data Futures, uh, Data and Agency. Uh, during this event and elsewhere, uh, you have heard and discussed about opaque and unjust data regimes, which are vital topics to be discussed around data. Uh, but this is not the whole story of our data fight lives. Uh, taking, taking agency at its focus and covering a range of data practices and initiatives including uh, data activism, quantified self, responsible data, and citizen-generated data. This panel will discuss the possibilities of different experiences of datafication and data subjectivities. Uh, we have distinguished panelists who are all experts on the topic. I'll briefly introduce them. Um, Mina Reckenstein is an associate professor at the Consumer Society Research Center and the Helsinki Center for Digital Humanities at University of Helsinki. Her ongoing research focuses on digitalization, datafication by highlighting emotional, social, political and economic aspects of current and emerging data practices. The disciplinary underpinnings of the work range from anthropology of technology, science and technology studies, and communication to consumer economics. Uh, Mirko Tobias Schaefer uh, is Associate Professor for New Media and Digital Culture at Utrecht University and the project leader of the Utrecht Data School. Mirko's research interest revolves around the sociopolitical impact of technology. He is the author of, author of the book Bastard Culture, How User Participation Transforms Cultural Production. Recently, he co-edited the volume, The Data Fight Society, Studying Culture Through Data. Stefania Milan, uh, who will be joining us um, in around uh, 10 minutes, uh, her uh, train is delayed, unfortunately. Uh, Stefania is Associate Professor of New Media and Digital Culture at the University of Amsterdam and Associate Professor of Media Innovation at the University of Oslo. Her research explores the interplay between digital technology and participation and activism and social movements, in particular uh, cyber governance and data epistemologies. She is the principal investigator of the Data Active Project funded through the European Research Council. And um, Jonathan Gray, uh, who is uh, joining us via video call, um, is lecturer in critical infrastructure uh, studies at the Department of Digital Humanities, King's College London, where he is currently writing a book on data worlds, open data and the politics of public information on the web. He is also co-founder of the Public Data Lab, research associate at the Digital Methods Initiative University of Amsterdam, and the Media Lab Sciences Po Paris, Jonathan is also senior advisor at the Global Civil Society Organization, Open Knowledge International. So uh, we'll start with Jonathan Gray. Uh, so Jonathan, the floor is yours. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. Uh, I wish I could see you, actually. I don't think I can uh, just see myself, but hopefully maybe at the end I can... Uh, Maybe turn the camera on in your own so I can uh, give you a wave. Um, but I'm very happy to be able to dive in. So, I guess just to kick things off today, uh, I wanted to start by stepping back and asking uh, several broad questions uh, collectively, uh, interviewing around it. And who gets to shape the future of uh, the so called data society? And my contention is that it's important to keep asking such questions because the answers that we give about uh, what data is, why it matters, and what is at stake can inform different kinds of responses and interventions, perhaps different kinds of data politics. So there are many different ways in which data and data infrastructures can become uh, what science and technology studies scholar Bruno Latour calls 
matters of concern uh, in policy and advocacy uh, we find uh, what has been called a data imagining process by public scholars including Mina, myself and, and others and uh, data imaginaries matter um, as the researcher Sheila Jasnow uh, puts it they can be construed, construed as collectively held institutionally stabilized and publicly formed vision of desirable futures animated by shared understandings of forms of social life and social order attainable through and supportable advances in science and technology. There are many different kinds of stories, narratives and imaginaries about data in society, including uh, new stories, films, pop culture, references, public debates about hackers, leakers, journalists, investigators, spooks, corporations, regulators, and, um, you know, and, and many of us uh, in this room. Um, consider, for example, uh, Eric Swartz, Black Mirror, Cambridge Analytica, The Matrix, Mr. Robot, The Panama Papers, Spotlight, Snowden, uh, Tron, uh, WikiLeaks, and The Wire. Uh, to mention a uh, quote from John Haraway, it matters what matters we use think other matters with, matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. So these, these imaginaries make a difference. And many of them uh, focus on, on one hand, uh, making data public um, through, for example, transparency, uh, data liberation, and what Sandra Brahman calls data as a resource, as well as keeping data private, uh, for, example, uh, for example, through privacy and data protection. And these narratives highlight vital aspects information politics, but they do not exhaust the role of data in contemporary societies. Data does more than simply designate aspects of the world. And data politics can be more than uh, making data public and keeping data private. And just to draw attention to and illustrate other aspects of information politics, I'll briefly draw attention to several aspects of my growing work on data world, destroying one um, a recent article which you could by searching for three aspects of data politics. Um, so firstly, one could consider data worlds uh, in terms of horizons of intelligibility. So data uh, not only designates, but it also enacts, forms, articulates, participates, and brings things into being. Uh, data makes things intelligible, whether through populations, for policy makers, or audiences for advertisers. And contemporary data advocate, uh, activist practices can be read as interventions towards intelligibility whether uh, rendering uh, police killings, human rights violations, land conflicts, migration deaths, air pollution, carbon emissions, or tax avoidance, legible. Uh, this includes the creation of what Helen Rand calls enumerated entities of the numbers which come to life and come to matter in different situations. That's the first intelligibility. Secondly, one could consider data not only in terms of the uh, uh, its ability to represent aspects of the world and make things intelligible, but also uh, organisation of relations. Uh, data can assemble, enable and enact relationships between people, states, markets, companies, states and environments, uh, involving people individually and or collectively as platform users, commodities, debtors, computers, reporters, monitors, censors, experts, co-investigators or other things. And just to give a single example, in one recent case I've been studying uh, Amnesty International Decoders Initiative uh, can be understood as a form of uh, what I call data witnessing, which is uh, both, uh, machine learning algorithms, social media data, satellite imagery, and you know, in different countries to attend to situations of injustice. Uh, attending to who and uh, what data brings together can inform and inspire and critique, but also alternative practices, including ways in which care, concern, and solidarity can be constructed, structured, extended into the data. So thirdly and finally, one can consider data worlds in terms of transnational coordination. Uh, data worlds can provide the background against which things become seeable, saleable, and do with data across border. Whether we're talking about austerity and fifth of the thing, multinational taxation, climate change, and migration. Data worlds can be enlisted in the service of extractivism, organization, solidarity, or subjugation across borders. And data worlds can be understood in relation to histories of statistical coordination in the 19th century, colonialism, neoliberalism, the emergence of international institutions, multinational corporations, transnational civil society, 
dominated technological networks. We're carried in a moment where platforms have become the dominant form of organising data and data flows in very particular ways, according to the element of course, the double logic of uh, decentralising platform features and recentralising platform ready data. And of course, this is not limited to large technology companies. The notion of government as a platform has led several states, including the UK, to explore how public information can be made programmable and drawn, transformed into a resource for private sector innovation, drawn on emerging, emerging models from technology industries. Yet the platform as a form does not exhaust uh, different sorts of knowledge, sociality, and politics which we see in contemporary data society. I hope that attending to such different perspectives on what data is, what data does, how it can be involved in making things intelligible, organizing relations, and coordinating things across borders, may help to inform and enrich analyses and interventions around the role of data in collective life. Uh, in the current moment, and for many reasons, we need not only urgent action, but also ambition and imagination. We may aspire, for example, not only to regulate platforms, but also to break them up, bring them into public ownership, support entirely different kinds of data infrastructures. Just to conclude, data isn't only about data. We are not our data selves, and the dominant forms of platform and data infrastructures are not the only ones. Other data worlds are possible. And as Stefania, Pinner and Mukka pointed out in their work, and which we'll hopefully discuss further, if we look carefully, we may find seeds of inspiration for other kinds of data futures already around us. Thanks very much, Jonathan. So, uh, so the quantified self. Um, technology developers started doing a form of kind of uh, uh, self-knowledge through numbers. And uh, at first I was kind of appalled by this idea. I was like, okay, so now we are turning ourselves into complete datafied subjects. We are making, making sensors of ourselves. But then I started attending the meetings, and something interesting was happening in the quantified self meetings around these three questions, which were always the same. So people would present what they had done with personal data and explain what did they do, how did they do it, and what did you learn. And I think that in many ways, when you talk about agency, this is the level where we have to operate. We have to, as Jonathan was saying, we have to understand what the data is, we have to understand what can be done with it, and we have to understand what can be learned with it. And, uh, and I still think that this is one of the, like, these three questions are actually one of the most important uh, innovations of the quantified self uh, movement. Because, yes, the movement is, there's a really annoying sound here, I hope you don't mind that. Uh, so, um, the movement is it's firmly embedded in the data economy because uh, you couldn't do the self-quantification if you didn't. Sorry. Excellent. Thank you very much. So, uh, so it is all of the critique. I don't have to start, start kind of talking about the data economy critique here because I think we all are kind of on the same level that there's something very problematic in the data economy. But what the QS was doing, it was kind of working inside the data economy. And uh, already 2014, uh, Don Nafus from Intel and Jamie Sherman, they started talking about it as a, as a kind of a form of soft politics. So it is the place where you can actually start question why data matters in ways that go beyond advertising or controlling the behaviors of others. So when the social scientists kind of entered the field of QS and started saying that, okay, there are all these like neoliberal dupes that don't understand what is going on, I felt kind of like, well, please go and see, because uh, this is another quote, which is very good, uh, by Gary Wolf, who is, uh, uh, who is one of the co-founders of the movement. He's saying that, yes, there is this biomedical techno service complex inc which is basically the dominant paradigm now. But within this paradigm, what the quantified self is doing, it's kind of trying to work within that paradigm. It's doing it in a, in a kind of, I think this is beautifully said, he talks about it kind of imitation game, matching both internal machines of biology and psychology and external machines of administration and surveillance. 
when we are talking about data economy, we are talking about administra administrative processes and surveillance. But within that logic, there is something that we can do. So equipped with these kinds of ideas, I started looking at the Finnish uh, My Data movement. Teemu Ropponen is here, who is one of the... So he's kind of like, I'm the friendly critic of the My Data movement. So when I say that there are some problems with the My Data movement, I'm saying it, saying it in a friendly way. So what the My Data movement was about, it was really like trying to reverse what is happening in the da data economy with this idea that we have uh, organization-centric models of the data, data economy, so we cannot control what kind of data is, uh, is uh, gathered of us and how, it's, uh, how, it's, um, how the analysis is, is done. And my data movement is trying to reverse this. So they are saying that this needs to become human-centric and the human needs to be in the middle. And of course, it's, this is a very kind of... Uh, uh, at first I was like, well, this is a bit naive way of thinking about how the world works, but it's a good ideal. It's a good ideal that we actually try to reverse some of the, some of the developments that have happened. So what my data wants is, my data wants solidarity, it wants dignity, it wants participation and trust. These are guiding values of my data. But my data has also other values. It also wants to speed up the data economy. So in a way, it's internally very conflicted. It wants everything. And that's also its, its, its problem, in, uh, in, in my opinion. So we started looking at uh, the movement with my, uh, my colleague. Um, just tell me when I don't have time, because I don't want to okay, take yeah. Mirko's time. <laughs> Uh, with my um, colleague Tuukka Lehtimi, we started looking at the My Data movement and what did we actually pay attention to was that unlike in the QS, where people were always forced to go into these very uh, specific details, in the My Data uh, initiative, you could still, on a very, uh, still talk about these things on a very abstract uh, level. So when you say trust, all of us have certain ideas of trust, but it's not very easy to make it op opera I can never say this word operationalize. How do you operationalize trust in a in a kind of techno driven uh, movement? So one of the most well formulated stances in terms of agency that kept floating was the monetization of personal data, which was kind of like, whoa. Okay, so these people who are actually trying to reverse the data economy, they are reintroducing the, uh, the economy as data as currency model. So discussing data in the, in the property paradigm. Okay, yes. And these ideas came from Silicon Valley, of course. Uh, here is uh, Jan Nanier, uh, who is a very fascinating person, has also done some work as a midwife. So what he's saying is that if we talk about digital dignity, what we actually need to make happen, we need to become commercial owners of our own data. And within the My Data uh, scene, there's like various ideas of how you actually start creating this personal data market. From our perspective, as, uh, as social scientists, of course, you know, when you start expanding the data economy by doing something this, you are entering a very, and, and actually, our article, if you're interested in this, uh, just came out, Social Imaginaries of Data Activism in Big Data and Society, where we are detailing why it's problematic that you commodify personal data and you think that you can actually reverse the economy by doing that. So, what we kind of, uh, we, we give like cer certain kind of ideas of how to move forward then. If you have the technological aspect, and you have the kind of more critical aspect that we have, like we, we, we can point to the kind of the, the gaps and flaws in the my data thinking. So what do we actually can do together? And we offer some examples of you know, how people are thinking about data commons now, they are thinking about cooperative models, uh, thinking about new kinds of business models. But what we actually <laughs> come back to is three questions. I don't have uh, them thought through as, as, as well as the QS, but you know something that we have to still do. We have to 
work case by case how to com combine technological and socio-critical data activism. What's the data in question? How is it worked? By whom? And what Sozana Tsubov, who apparently is today here, also is saying, it's a question of power. Who gets to learn with data? Thanks very much, Mina. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, I'm really happy to be here. When Imge noticed me, uh, notified me last week that she wants to do something on data and agency, I thought that's a really good opportunity to think about something that we haven't paid much, much attention to in our research so far. But uh, I want to do that more in the future, and that's a good idea to uh, start uh, discussing that. So. I quickly introduce what, what I am actually doing. I run a research group called Utrecht Data School and Data Fight Society over at Utrecht University. And we were interested initially in to what extent are data, datafication, or in general the narrative of big data affecting our understanding of citizenship. And in order to research that, we thought it might be interesting to go directly into the very institutions that shape citizenship and democracy and start researching datafication from within municipal organizations, municipal governments, and national government. And we do so by developing services for these organizations, uh, which, um, which they want and need, and they hire us in the capacity as experts, and we help them most often uh, by advising them on data ethics. Um, Unfortunately, I haven't put a picture in there. So we, we developed a tool that we use to help data teams at um, government organizations or companies to rethink their data projects in terms of ethical pitfalls or opportunities and to see to what extent their data projects match their own public values or violate those values. By doing so, we gain a very intimate insight into how these organizations work, what understanding they have of data ethics, uh, what kind of data projects they're planning, what operational capacities are present at these institutions, and how uh, actors within the institution shape the understanding of datafication. So this is what we do. And uh, while doing so, we notice there are a number of discourses that actually shape our understanding of data ethics. And this is just a sketch as it's completely unstable, and maybe I'm just uh, talking here uh, um, uninformed, but it's the first attempt to, to try to order the things that shape our understanding of data ethics. So firstly, I distinguished three sorts of discourses. The media or popular media discourse, a regulatory discourse, think of making laws, making uh, regulations, whether it be on a national level or on a local uh, uh, level, and institutional discourses, everything from organizations, associations, advocacy groups, NGOs, etc. Uh, also civil action would fall in that institutional part and many of the people in the room and in this conference would uh, probably uh, affiliate with that level. Let's go through these three levels. So on, on the level of media discourses, we have general media narratives that shape an understanding of technology. This is everything from technological imaginaries as it has been developed by several authors. And at the moment, that's uh, uh, covering mostly artificial intelligence, always called as AI or big data or surveillance and big data. Um, uh, mainstream media attention goes to several events or incidents Edward Snowden is maybe the, the most prominently Facebook and Cambridge Analytica, although Cambridge Analytica was not just a, a, a bugma, but, but rather a feature of the Facebook uh, universe. Uh, the spectacular leaks, uh, as for instance, the Strava leak uh, and others. This is where mainstream media attention goes to and shapes the understanding of media technology and what could go wrong. Uh, how do we trace that? In our talks with these people in uh, government organizations, we note, we observe how they refer to data, and then we note that they indeed are shaped by events as Edward Snowden or Cambridge Analytica, and that is triggering it in attention towards responsibility of data practices. And this is something we're interested in. That's what we note down, really a sort of Latourian way of mapping actors and agency. And then you have professional and special interest media, which are way more interesting, but uh, most academics tend to overlook them. These are magazines, this professional group 
is consulting and reading. And I just try to listen uh, here the, the Dutch examples. I uh, uh, will call them out. Ibistur, which is a, a magazine that is targeted, uh, is targeting uh, civil civil servants. And the Ingenieur, which is a magazine for engineers. Uh, Binnenlands Bestuur, which is about again civil servants and uh, uh, governance. Uh, the the VNG magazine, which is the the medium of the association of Dutch municipalities, and so forth. So you have on the professional level a range of media that are also interested in speaking about data practices and responsible data practices, or what could go wrong, or what, how could it be avoided. Um, we did a very small research. One of our master students looked into to what extent the mainstream media were covering the GDPR when it was about to to uh, uh, take effect uh, in, in May last year. So he looked at the previous year and noticed that mainstream media were hardly covering the GDPR. The media that were actually covering it were these professional magazines. In that case, also marketing magazines because the marketing branch is um, uh, specifically targeted by the GDPR. And then we have media attention to local events. That would be something like the city of Amsterdam that uh, um, commissioned a research by a local data science solution provider to map their loitering youth. They took data of these teenagers from Facebook and made a network analysis where do which groups of teenagers hang out in public space and try to identify them personally. And there were charges pressed and the city of Amsterdam had to admit that they violated the GDPR in that as instance. Uh, or the coverage of municipalities using Wi-Fi tracking in inner cities to, to uh, um, create a more efficient uh, uh, traffic fluid through the cities. Or algorithms for detecting social benefits, fraud, and so on. So these are things that are locally reported on and force very often local politicians, council, or city employees to react and develop an understanding of data ethics. Then we have regulatory discourses. That would be anything on the level of law. The most, the, the largest impact had undoubtedly the GDPR. Every time we speak to these parties, we notice the GDPR is actually what motivated inside the organizations to start worrying about data and data practices and to review their own data practices. And then there's the General Administrative Law Act and very important, the Freedom of Information Act in the Netherlands called Wet Openbarheid van Bestuur. Uh, which also forces these organizations to critically look at the data practices. And that's something that we as a research group are also uh, targeted of. Uh, we sometimes work together with these uh, organizations and help them with actual data projects. Like for instance, mapping uh, all recipients of social benefits and uh, uh, calculating uh, what factors lead to someone receiving a number of social benefits and being in the system for a long time. And doing such research is something that is done on an individual level. So, of course, we have to follow the GTBR by, by, uh, by the line. And we notice that our research is sometimes retrieved under the Freedom of Information Act, that because a concerned citizen righteously says, the law is violated in this kind of research and they file this, this kind of information act. Lawsuits, very important to, to push anything in, in, uh, in uh, policy land. Uh, advocacy groups in the Netherlands that filed a lawsuit against the use of Siri, the System Risiko Indicatie, which is a um, major data analysis system by, by one of the ministries in the Netherlands to detect the likelihood of someone committing tax fraud or social benefits fraud or uh, the uh, already mentioned case of loitering use in the Netherlands. Hello, Stefania. <laughs> um, another thing that is really vital, a really important actor and, and shows significant agencies are parliamentary inquiries and the responses on this. Uh, legend has it that the Netherlands started thinking about open data just because of a parliamentary inquiry by a member of the Green Left Party because he noticed no one of the running cabinet was part of the open data workshop that was hosted by the Obama administration. And so uh, this parliamentary inquiry actually led to the uh, establishment of open data initiatives at the Dutch ministries. Uh, we recently had the inquiries concerning the already mentioned Siri uh, and the response letter by Minister Decker on algorithms and transparency. So here already a discourse on regulatory level on uh, data responsibility is shaping. 
you could also say that all these areas blur. For instance, here we have um, Virginia Eubanks of the book Automating in Inequality speaking at the uh, second chamber at the parliament in, in the Netherlands and informing politicians there. Uh, one of the biggest problems we see in, in this entire nexus of, of problems is that the politicians still haven't recognized data as a political issue. So no party but one in the Netherlands has actually a plan how to work with data, and this one party is the pirate party that has no chance for a seat in parliament. And the other parties, quite in contradiction to what the green parties have done over the past uh, 30 years, have not developed yet an ideological viewpoint on how to deal with data and data practices in general. So something like Eubanks reading at the parliament might actually stimulate uh, initiative in, in uh, that area. On the level of institutional discourses, organizations, institutions, professional associations, etc., we see local government organizations uh, as, as one example, and their trailblazer employees in the various organizations are vital in pushing the agenda for data ethics and data responsibility. Very often you could describe them also as the angry orphans in an organization that know there is something that should uh, it's worth more attention and more care, but they do not have the support of the organization, uh, and they work very hard to gain that support and to create attention for the topic. How many? Two minutes. Um, then on the advisory and advocacy, you have something like technology impact assessment institutions as the Rathenau Institute in the Netherlands or the Scientific Council of Government Policy, whose reports have been instrumental in creating awareness for the need for data ethic or data responsibility. On academia, you have critical data studies, data justice, something I, I skipped this in discussion that uh, Mina, uh, Stefania, and I would have one day. I think that academia is quite excluded from the entire discourses here and is something that is an ivory tower on its own and has very little uh, access to the discourses that I already mentioned. Uh, except for the few popular intellectuals, public intellectuals like uh, Kathy O'Neill or Virginia Eubanks that are invited. For the rest, academia is something that contributes very little to uh, this part. Uh, maybe with the exception of some, some uh, uh, law, uh, law information law groups. Civic action, in your maybe the most prominent, I, I think uh, one, one of the, the really great examples how uh, civic action could work is Max Schrems's uh, attempt, a um, successful attempt to retrieve his data from Facebook, or in the Netherlands, the debate uh, on the Dragnet law. So, um, just quick before I close, we try to participate in these discourses as well as a research group. Here, my research group is present at a business fair that targets uh, government organizations with data solutions and we present our data ethics decision aid there as if we were a company that is providing a service. We try to get keynote positions on these professional business events uh, where uh, the employees of uh, government organizations meet and get their information about data practices. And we stand there next to the entire range of consulting companies and commercial companies that sell their data science solutions to uh, public management and try to push the agenda for responsible data practices. Why am I calling it, and this is to close, responsible data practices? I think that data ethics is also widely shaped by a popular discourse that uh, is at the moment hijacked by large industry players because it avoids the aspect of regulation. If you push for data ethics, it means that you are pushing for self-regulation in the industrial sector, and I'm more interested in responsible data practices and accountability that can be within the traditional forms of public management and, um, and democracy deliver more than just a lip service to, to ethical use of data. Um, I skip this. And uh, I uh, uh, would be happy to receive uh, more input, especially from, because this, this addresses only an uh, academic debate. Uh, I, I just see the, the way that we, we work with data subjects at the moment as a continuation of a very, very limited dis, uh, uh, disposition of hegemony on the one side and the subject on the other side. And I think we have to break out of that and to acknowledge that within government organizations already, a lot of discourses are shaping a different approach to data practices. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Rika. And next, uh, Stefania Milan. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for jumping in right in the middle of the discussion here. Luckily, my colleagues preceding me and, and Inge in particular have been excellent in trying to make sure that this conversation can fit also those that, that jump in uh, at the very last minute. Um, so I'm very happy to be here and I would like uh, to thank the organizers and Inge in particular for this lovely invitation. Now, I hope um, I'm going to just compliment what you already heard uh, uh, from Mina, uh, Mirko, and Jonathan by providing uh, what we might call a sort of simplified sociological perspective and uh, some food for thought on the role also of us at academic, just to provide a little bit of a um, more cheerful uh, perspective on this. So what I'm going to share are just some vague notes on the conditions of possibility for agency in the datafied society. I guess there's no need to uh, explain you that the, in this context that the datification has really accelerated the crisis of liberal democracy. It has in a way or another sort of broken what the philosophers of the early days called the social contract, literally putting into question the legitimacy of the authority of the state on over uh, its citizens. I mean, privacy infringements are one of the reasons why we don't trust the state, right? Uh, anymore, or at least some of us don't. And um, so let me wear my sociological hat uh, for uh, a minute and ask then, you know, go a little backwards and ask really what is agency in the data fight society? What do we mean by agency? Where can we find it? Where can we locate it? And how can we foster it once we have identified where maybe one of the many places uh, where we can uh, find it? And as I mentioned, uh, I'm going to wear you know, my hat as a sociologist and just remind those of you who are not familiar with uh, you know, the basic sociological notion that when we look at society, we tend to, at least from the sociological point of view, distinguish between agency or the capacity of people like us, both individual and collectively, to act or, act or on our own will, and the overarching structure, not just overarching, but surrounding us. So everything that surrounds people, from institutions to social norms. So those formal uh, or informal factors that hinder or enhance our possibility to act, act or, own, or act freely, if you want. In fact, I mean, when we talk about agency, we can really distinguish, and I don't want to lecture you, but we can really distinguish between different uh, types of agency, you know, especially when we think about notification. We could think about consumer agency, so we are clients of a number of apps that we install on our phone and the consumer agency then maybe can be retrieved or at least the boundaries of the consumer agency are inscribed in the contract represented by uh, the terms of services. But of course, uh, there's also what I believe is a little more important than just consumer agency, which is sort of political slash citizen agency. So our ability to act as citizens as part of, of a polity. And of course, I, uh, agency can be an individual and collective. And that becomes very important in the age of datification because, of course, I am myself a client, a player, um, a data fight subject, but I also have the possibility, if I so will, to act in conjunction with other people to, for example, resist this intrusion of the data fight structure into my possibility of agency. But what really we have to remember is that agency is ultimately a process. So it's not a static property, as we often speak um, about it, uh, of an individual or a social group, for example, but it is a process, something which is contingent, very depends on very, very much wh on where I am at the given time, it's temporarily bounded, might uh, be able to exercise a tiny bit of agency somewhere, but not in other contexts, uh, sometime, but not in others, and um, it is evolving, so it changes. It is also uh, intentional, reflexive, so there's something that, I mean, we have to put ourselves into it, right? We have to have free will, but also the intention to act. It is informed by what we know about our society, what we know, for example, about datification. Uh, and here in this room, we are particularly lucky, I like to think, in that sense, compared to other average ordinary citizens, although we know very well those don't exist. It is relational, so I might, you know, change my agency, so to speak. My agency might evolve in relation to uh, those of um, at the agency or those in the room, for example, and it is very much situated 
it depends on the context. And this is the, the end of the sort of micro sociological um, um, lecture, sorry about that. But so if we are to find agency in the data fight subject, where would we find it? Uh, well, uh, because uh, me and also my, my research team in Amsterdam, which is called Data Active, we like to look at what we call data activism. So practices of bottom-up engagement with data, datification, surveillance. So form of resistance, for example, by those who think that datification is a little, it's, it's detrimental to political agency, for example, but also practices of proactive engagement by those people who instead think that datification offers uh, a lot of possibilities for, for example, changing the world. And of course, all of the nuances in between, because this is a sort of continuum uh, where we find a number of different practices. And so if we are to find, sort of locate ideally agency in the data fight subject, well, we can talk about bottom up data practices. So I'm taking at the perspective of the citizen, both individual and collective. So how do people make sense of notification and act upon it? How do people make sense of the privacy, privacy infringements, for example, that they are affected by? And how can they react to it, for example? Or how can, and I, I believe Mina has already shared something about that, how can um, individuals who you know, have the agency to, to choose whether they want to become you know, subject of notification or an agent of notification in a way or another through, for example, quantifying their own uh, practices? These practices are socio-technical. I mean, they're never just social. They're never just fluffy and soft. They have a very strong technical component, if you want, infrastructural component even. Anything from the devices to the servers to, to the internet backbones it is part uh, of this, this form of engagement, whether we are aware or not. And um, they are variably critical and variably conscious, if you want, in the sense that there are different nuances when we think about also data activism, but also more in general, bottom-up data uh, practices. Um, so, um, and they can be, of course, individual and collective again, right? It can be me, myself, acting, for example, decided to use Tor, but of course Tor doesn't make any sense if I use it by myself, right? Because it doesn't work if this is just used on me. I mean, it's not like hiding in a corner and that works if no one finds me. It's a little more complicated, so I need a society around me. So then, uh, you know, when do data People who suffer from datification become then active data subjects. So, well, uh, you know, all of this is about taking essentially a critical approach, but, but the question is what transforms citizens into activists or into conscious actors, conscious uh, data or political data uh, subjects? So what transforms data, if you want more generally, into activism, where activism is intended here as the progressive engagement in order to make the world a better place. Because of course there are, again, various types of activism. But here, um, I guess we focus only on the, the sort of more positive one. Well, what transformed data into activism is, well, it's something that I never wrote about and I'm just playing around with the idea here. And it's what I called data logis. As, a, as in Italian, we often study ancient languages. And I'm fascinated by the notion of logos, by the idea of how do you make sense of things, right? Which, is, uh, which relates to how you speak about something, but especially how you think and envision and imagine something. Ties up with the notion of imagery that you already discussed earlier. And these data logis, which is a bit of a, you know, a sort of portmanteau of different words, but uh, indicate um, ways of making sense of data slash datification, surveillance, privacy, and you name it, all of the social, social technical process, processes that have to do with datification. I mean, as academics, of course, we really like to create new words. That's why we are in the world, apparently. But uh, so, I mean, this is just a new word. I'm not even sure it's very useful. I just offer it to your critical scrutiny. But really looking inside of what do, what do I mean if I need to disentangle this notion of data logics? Well, I think that what really transforms data into activism or people who suffer merely and feel disempowered from notification to people who can act on notification is two things. Alternatives are epistemologies, so alternative ways of imagining, alternative imaginaries maybe, to go back to what we discussed earlier, just guessing here what was discussed earlier, but I think I guess right. Uh, so alternative ways, novel ways of making sense of 
of the world around me as a subject or my society and my position within this complex datafied world, but also notions, practices of engagement. So how do I decide to engage in this? So this is what then creates these data logis. So I think to act in the in, in datification, to sort of reclaim our agency in the age of datification, it's not just an imaginary, it's an imaginary which is very much bound in specific technological practices, conscious or not conscious. So because uh, my 10 minutes are coming to an end, uh, what are these three elements that what do we need to really reclaim our agency? This is a tentative list. You can probably find many more, but what we need critical consciousness. So we need to critically at at address these issues. First of all, care and think up a little bit about it and find, you know, a, a sort of an explanation, so to speak, to for to for what is happening to us, even when we are surrounded by the grey area of privacy infringement in smart city, for example. Grassroots later literacy becomes very important, so we have to learn as well how to intervene. It's not that trivial. And then the third is what we may call critical imagination. It ties again up with the notion of imaginaries, but it's the ability to think about uh, alternatives. So not just imagine what is happening, but also imagine alternative future, which is also in the, in the title of this session. And um, I arrived at the critical moment in which Mirko was complaining that we as academics don't have much power, and I totally agree with that, power, decision-making power, or at least we often, in our ivory tower, very often for our faults as well, um, we don't really have the ability to, uh, to influence those very important processes Is was talking about. It's actually a very good exception in that sense. But so I would like to, to end uh, with a sort of more uh, positive note and, uh, you know, think a little bit for a minute what as critical observers, privileged observers, people who have the, the time, the resources, the ability, the taste for thinking about these things, what can we do? Well, I do believe we have a critical role to play in fostering this critical imagination, in uh, you know, fostering the emergence of grassroots data practices and more awareness around these issues. And there are many, many roles that we can play. I just list some, not of all of them derived from my own research. We can you know, perform the, the role of diagnostics, so people will you know, try to identify the problem. We can be storytellers. We have to break down the story in smaller chunks chunks that are relevant to the people we talk to. We can be educators, most of us are, translators sometimes, and I'm not talking about language, I'm talking more about translations of imagery, of, of experiences, skill transfers, facilitators of the emergence of these critical data practices. And I guess I'll leave it at that. I hope it was vaguely fitting the rest of the conversation. Thanks. Apologies again, thank you very much. Well, now uh, I'll open the floor uh, for audience Q&A. But before that, may I please have you all uh, on the stage, all our speakers? This is um, connected to the imagination, actually. It also ties with, uh, with Mirko's work. Um, I was a bit unfairly like talking about my data only from the perspective of... Uh, of uh, the property paradigm and personal data. But my point there is that when you don't have kind of a way where to go, you grab what you have. And it's very difficult to find imaginary solutions because the dominant framework is so powerful that I think we actually have to do a lot of work to, to carve those positions where we actually see what we can do. So I'll give you a concrete example. Uh, a lot of the stuff that is done around automatic decision making, for instance, is about uh, profiling people, grouping them, um, it's about scoring. And that's not on only what we can do with automation. There's a lot of like really interesting things that we can do. We can think about new kinds of big data driven knowledge pra practices, which actually I believe that you are trying to get to those with, uh, with your work. And, uh, and I have also tried to, and you are trying to. So, so what we actually come up with is we are all kind of in this imaginary realm, trying to <laughs> desperately come up with solutions of how to do this differently. And it's really slow, and it really requires playing and experimentation. You want to continue from this? Well, uh, yes, uh, I, I, 
I agree. We don't have power, as in terms of power, Stefania. But uh, what we can do as academ academics, and it's actually our duty, is called impact. And I think we can do a way better job there. And uh, without just trying to, to laud uh, uh, the work we do at Utrecht Data School, uh, with, with a lot of effort and pain, we found, I think, a very efficient way of producing better impact while, while trying to directly work within the discourses I, I sketched and uh, to finding a way of entrance. And if, if you work in Dutch municipalities and you do anything with data ethics, there's a big chance that you'll end up working with the data ethics decision aid that we developed. And another thing is I think it's not accurate to see the state as a homogeneous block and to think we, we cannot trust the state. Um, of course, I disagree with, with much of the agenda of the current uh, sitting cabinet in, in the Netherlands. But I have to say, as if I go to a ministry and I see they have an, a, a special lab on making algorithms transparent, I think, wow, that's, that's awesome. And then you go to a different ministry and they have a competing group that is called an open, open government uh, initiative. And so it's, it's such a big thing, uh, government and bureaucracy, that we shouldn't, and I think that would distract us, see it as a ho homogeneous block. We must find better ways of entrance and analysis. And that means also that humanity scholars must learn how to read uh, law and must concern themselves with political sciences. Yeah, I guess to, to build on this, uh, it's really, so it is a painful uh, process sometimes. It is definitely difficult and definitely a long-term process. Norm change is always long-term, right? So you might, uh, we might intervene at, at kind of the immediate or the day-to-day. -day. Sometimes it works, but sometimes, you know, to make the large population or a monster machine like governments or public administration aware of the problems and therefore able to act, uh, it takes uh, time. But then what you just said, Mirko, about the... The fact that uh, it's not homogeneous and it's much more complicated out there really should prompt us to think about creatively about solutions and about tactics and about strategies, which are different, right? So the mo more long-term strategy, but also the more kind of contingent tactic of, hey, I identified that one individual in that mm, public administration, whatever level that is, that might be a partner, right? And uh, yeah, I mean, institutions are large, larger machines, and to change the imagery of institutions, it's even more complicated, precisely because it's not homogeneous, precisely because there are, um, you know, these are institutions that act at various levels, but um, it is really important to take this sort of modular approach, interventionist approach, and uh, one that um, sort of, um, you know, like surfers, no? Surfers are there ready for when the big wave comes, this is not mine, it's a sociologist that wrote this, but a very beautiful metaphor, especially if you like the sea, to point to the fact that, um, you know, there might not be the perfect opportunity right now, but we have to be ready for when the perfect opportunity might come. And we have to be creative about that as well. Yeah, it is definitely broader than that. Thank you for the question. I had another slide <laughs> that was uh, detailing a little bit the many ways in which uh, some of us, at least not everyone, um, felt a little undermined, for example, after that there's no revelations, right? So there's clearly many moments uh, in the recent history in which, and, uh, 
in which the state has, uh, you know, it's, it's shown um, that it's naked, so to speak, like to go back to the emperor. I've decided to speak in references today, sorry. <laughs> but um, so take, for example, the Snowden uh, revelation. It's, it's old uh, history. If for those of us already studying surveillance, it was not news in a way or another. For many others, it was news. And it was the realization that um, there is a gray area much bigger than we would like to think. And this gray area um, is, uh, I mean, it is part of the functions of the state, you know, to be secretive, for example, about questions of national security. But we tend to think about national security in terms of, um, uh, you know, like um, spying and, you know, Cold War imaginaries, whereas sometimes it also goes to the detriment of citizens. In the extent to which that was done within a democracy and with little sort of safeguards for uh, citizens, because mostly citizens didn't know about it, then uh, freak many people out. This is a very simple example. I'm just interpreting what I've heard many times. Um, for example, attending crypto parties and asking people, so crypto parties, I'm sure you know what they are, but there are you know, occasions in which people come together to learn the basic of, of, of crypto, so essentially to protect their communications. And um, in many countries in the, in the world, I looked mostly at the European countries, but um, I met several people that were not interested in any of these things before. And for, for whom there's no revelation, I was like, oh, wow. I cannot trust my state anymore. I have to protect myself from the state. And if the enemy before was, uh, let's say, Microsoft in the 90s, talking about people a bit, a bit older, right? Then um, they realized that actually the story was a little more complex. They also to watch uh, their back because the one that was supposed to protect them was actually undermining their privacy in the name of a bigger a bigger goal. This is just an, an anecdote. Uh, it requires a much more uh, complex analysis, but I'm sure you can also complement that. So, a, a practical example would be in the Netherlands, a number of municipalities that are in the process of uh, acquiring uh, smart streetlights. So, they sell off the public infrastructure to a commercial party that promises to, to uh, place smart streetlights that are more cost efficient and, in addition, also are data platforms. And very often, and the municipalities are just learning to look properly into these contracts, very often. They, these contracts come with a, a, with a trap. So the data remain with the commercial provider of the streetlights, and only the commercial provider is the one who's deciding what kind of data are collected and for which uses. And that is actually undermining the power and the, the publicness of the municipality. And in such instances, it would be really helpful if the citizens of such a municipality would show interest in these affairs. Uh, René König, who is a fellow researcher from Germany, did a number of um, uh, uh, events where he and his colleagues tried to speak to citizens about what data do to their lives. And they had no one showing up there. There was just a lack of interest. So it's not only that politicians haven't recognized that data are a political topic, also the electorate has not yet recognized that data are shaping their lives as citizens. I wonder if um, some kind of advocacy have success, then we can expect that the market will adapt. So platforms are already serving uh, uh, services uh, in a sort of uh, hege hegemonic control of data and uh, priorities and uh, everything. Then we start to offer more options, maybe uh, for premium services or maybe for every user in the platform. So the question is, uh, should this uh, method to retain more agency also works only in a distributed uh, architecture or may also work in a centralized architecture? This is a good question and there's actually no answer to it. So um, many of the people um, who work close to the my data community think that the distributed one is, is the way to go. Then there are others who think that they actually need to be centralized and actually uh, public sector need to, needs to be somehow uh, somehow part of it because uh, if you if you think like um, what this kind of my data world would look like where you actually would be you would control your personal data it's it's um, it's very idealistic 
But in order for that to work, you would have to have some sort of intermediaries that kind of collect the personal data together and somehow uh, distribute it for you, uh, kind of like a operator model, for instance. So that's, that's like one model. Then there are others who are saying that the way to, to do it, it cannot be like bound to any kind of national infrastructures and it needs to be more like the blockchain model. So all of these models are currently being discussed, but you know, there's no, no one solution. So, so many of the solutions that are currently in the, being worked for are, are in their early stages. So, so it's infrastructure building, um, it could be cooperatives, it could be many things. I wish I could say that, yeah, we have it in place in Finland. We already did it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you can ask the question and I can repeat if you like. Um, okay. Can, uh, I can start. Um, the example with the social um, benefits for detection algorithms is uh, just a continuation of how government, uh, governments, local and national, uh, are guarding the poor population. And that's also another reason why they can uh, install these kinds of data analysis, because they have the data. So an algorithm on poverty prediction, which are also currently developed in the Netherlands, won't trace me because I'm not in that system. I'm not in, among the risk population that is according to the parameters of the public management in the likelihood of falling down the poverty line, although that could happen. I'm just not in that system. I'm not living in, in, a, in a, a, a subsidized uh, uh, apartment. I'm not getting uh, uh, social benefits. So I'm, my data are not in that system where these algorithms are uh, used. That's one part. So they use data they have. They could use the same algorithm, for instance, to trace people who are actually eligible for social benefits, but they don't. Um, but that aside, so I think the discussion should go around public values. And of course, I think there's an exclusion. We think from, from an enlightenment perspective that we, we want to educate all citizens in becoming aware of how important it is to think about their data and what data practices might do to their life. But that would be, of course, naive to think that that is an effort that would, would manifest. What we can do is push for a political debate that at least parties in the councils on a municipal level and parties on national level start thinking about how to relate public values to policies that shape data practices. The examples that I gave of data activism, they are very much uh, the techno elite, technologically savvy. Uh, gender is an important issue. They're mostly men. So, um, so when I was starting to work with these groups, you know, people were asking me, you know, um, how can you work with, you know, techno elitists? There's like so many people who can't even, you know, get to it. Um, I have uh, kind of said to myself that this is important because this is where the data power is being formed or some sort of reverse to the dominant data power. Uh, this morning we launched our report, Automatic Decision Making in Europe in the Commission. And uh, it's obvious that a lot of the profiling, classifying, it is targeting the weakest in the society. So uh, as, as um, data activism forms certain kind of agencies, there are other people who have no say in how they are classified. And we should, we should keep those both in the same picture. And then we start having maybe some corrections. And Jonathan would also like to answer the question, and then you, uh, Stefania. 
Uh, yes, Jonathan. Ah, sorry. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. So just to return to a point that I made uh, towards the, uh, the, end, the end of my intervention, um, uh, I sort of mentioned very briefly this notion that data politics is not just about data. Um, and I guess, just, just to kind of emphasise that again, I think it's, it's interesting when you think in terms of, um, for example, a class or a, a demography, like a lot of uh, historians and sociologists of statistics have argued that, in fact, data plays a role in not just describing pre-existing social phenomena, but in um, making uh, society legible in certain ways, such as by thinking in terms of class, or, you know, the other examples are uh, things like uh, unemployment, where well, you have joblessness, having unemployment is something which can be discussed and becomes an sort of entity of concern and of political uh, life partly enabled through certain uh, practices and processes of quantification. Uh, the economy, for example, you know, uh, lots of historians say the economy as such didn't really come into being until sometime in the early 20th century as an object beyond, um, you know, financial management at the level of the household or perhaps at the level of the state. But certainly not anything uh, that you could talk about uh, in the terms of talk about now, in terms of the world of economy. And I'll say this is, you know. Recognising that data politics is not just about data also um, suggests different forms of expertise, and also in defence of um, academics. I'm not just talking about you know us. I think if you look at how the systems are organised, for better or for worse, there are many forms of academic expertise, law, economics, policy, uh, which which go on to um, sort of, uh, sustain and enable these different ways in which society is performed, um, uh, in which. Uh, different sorts of systems of data are involved in the course at the moment, um, uh, you know, as we see different forms of targeting, different forms of big data practices. Uh, there is this question, it is a question, about the extent to which um, these different forms of not unproblematic ways of knowing citizens through demography uh, uh, and statistics are being potentially displaced or complemented with uh, other ways of knowing uh, citizens and, and knowing society through transactions and so on. Also, uh, Merkel's point about um, you know should we should we enter broader data literacy? I guess sort of another sort of uh, classic model we have from the 1980s is uh, something called the information deficit model, which emphasises that we shouldn't just look at systems in terms of their ignorance and their lack of capacities, but also uh, to look at their expertise and and, and uh, the capacities they do possess. And again, that's not just in relation to data. I guess the sort of um, something that I find is an interesting area of um, broadening our perspective uh, of data policies is to look at how those different sorts of issues and issue publics and issue activists give rise to uh, different forms of um, uh, uh, data infrastructures and data practices, which may be different from the, the dominant ones that you might be concerned with. So it's not just about data, per se. Thanks. Jonathan, uh, Just uh, to complement what has been said so far, thank you very much for raising the issue, the, the fact that the notion of citizenship can be exclusionary in itself, but also that there are many other factors, right, like race, uh, class and gender. And just to make it more complicated, we should remember that also, not only, you know, it's not just a matter of expertise and who has access to something, so can I buy a phone? to have the time, the energies to engage in thinking about my pri privacy because my stomach is full or not. But what is uh, situated and varies is also the value that we attribute to specific uh, things, let's say. So for example, um, if I think about privacy, it is a value for us culturally, but also because we have the luxury of that. In the moment in which I want to enter in a subsidy scheme, for example, because I'm a poor person, I'm going to be very happy to give up all my data and wear whatever watch or whatever app that uh, helps me to enter this, uh, uh, you know, so that these are conditions of visibility, so to speak, that are condition of existence for um, the poor, let's say, for, for the sake of simplification, that we often even uh, forget when thinking about um, this thing. So what is a value in the data first society also changes in relation to these factors. Uh, any other question? Rocco? Actually, I wanted to, to, to ask Mirko to make it simpler and not more complicated. And you were probably being asked by saying that uh, like, uh, people working in uh, media studies or digital humanities should start with 
legislation, so which kind of legislation people should read and which are the sites where you think things are happening. Um, uh, we are reading with our students the GDPR, for instance to see how public values are implemented in the GDPR and how the GDPR is an evolution from earlier privacy uh, regulations. And that is what we do, and uh, I, I think the GDPR answers many, many privacy issues we are, we are confronted with in day-to-day uh, -day data practices and uh, saves, us, saves us time to think about solutions. So I think it makes things simpler. It's, uh, I don't know whether that's... Uh, No, that's that's right. But uh, but I would I would argue we find that uh, in in the G many aspects in the GDPR and as um, Paul Nemitz, who's a principal advisor to the European Commission on Fundamental Rights, um, expressed at a, a lecture at Utrecht University, uh, that the challenge at the moment is to have the um, authorities who actually have to enforce the GDPR to to support them in actually enforcing it. So I think that many of the algorithms that are currently developed on a municipal or even national level might prove to be illegal and maybe are not used. Answering that question is outside of my competence, so. I think Temu knows this, but I think we have like 800 different bits of law that actually are kind of, uh, could apply in many of the questions that we have talked about today, so it, it is a mess. Thanks very much. Uh, Rene, you have a question? <laughs> These microphones work as well, right? We can pass on to the audience. If there are other questions, of course. And uh, so, ah, yes. Uh, or maybe would you mind coming over here? Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll just comment. Uh, thank you, Mina, for pointing out you as a friendly critic of the My Data community. Uh, um, so, um, yeah, I'd just like to point out maybe there is agencies also defining uh, um, what the My Data movement is about. So, one of our advisors actually said last week was visiting Finland, and said that we are pathologically democratic, um, which I think was a great insult um, um, yes. or compliment. Uh, but I think it's exactly, it's one of the key tensions actually to define what we think about these personal data markets and such. So just a comment on that. Thanks. Thank yeah, um, and I totally appreciate that because my data when it started 
Um, and also when quantified self-started, self it's important not to define it right away because you do want to get different stakeholders on board because my firm belief is that we cannot learn about these things if we, if we don't interact with the businesses, civil servants. Um, we have to understand how they think, the academics. And once we start understanding how, how people think about these things, then we can start having some sort of, a, some sort of a, an agenda that actually brings us forward. And this is what we've tried to do with the My Data, that we understand that our critical perspective and the technology perspective, uh, they don't necessarily come together. But social scientists, they need technology developers because... Uh, we are building a society where technological infrastructures are doing politics. So, so we, we just can't ignore that. And I think that this is the fundamental thing that we have to know so much now that I don't think that, I, I, I think that this kind of lifelong learning that this is forcing, forcing you, you have to understand about regulation, you have to understand about, uh, and, and also, you know, point about the regulation is that I actually think that, that um, many of the things that need regulation in this space could be kind of these combinations of self-regulation and legal regulation. Uh, at least in, in Finland, I have never experienced it during my career that technology developers are so interested in social science perspectives and regulatory perspectives. And they are asking, you know, what do we do? Because they have actually become to this realization that we have this political power and we are not equipped to 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 kind of work with this so they're like you know let's le let's read langdon winner oh. <laughs> um i to, just to, to to add to that what we see in the netherlands when we speak to uh, civil servants is that they notice that by carrying out data projects, they're actually doing political labor, but they do not have a mandate for doing so. So they are really, it's in their most vital interest to get more regulation and to attract the awareness of the policy arm to think about how these, these issues should be addressed. And uh, yeah, that, that's why they are so interested in carrying out the, in these data ethic uh, consultations because they want to avoid developing a political data project. They want to stay on the administrative side. But the moment you, you design a poverty predic a prediction process in, in a municipality, you notice it is inherently political because a liberal municipality will have a completely different approach than a social democratic one. A liberal one would not push for warning someone or alerting someone that the system thinks that you might be defaulting on your debt three months from now and you shouldn't buy that big TV you're just looking at right now. The liberals would say, well, spend your money. It's your money. It's your responsibility. And the social democratic approach would be, we send you a message saying, you should think about this, uh, and this spending and maybe save some money because three months from now, you'll be evicted. Okay, if there, are, um, if there are no further questions, uh, I'll ask for the final remarks from our speakers because we have only four minutes left. I think it's interesting to think about the different social imaginaries uh, uh, tied to data and uh, the, the impulses from the audience to, to the differences in, in what a citizen is, what citizenship actually constitutes, and the various capacities and operational capacities of citizens helps to, to think more properly about this. Yeah, probably what we have to do, I mean, the three of us are educators, many of you in the room are, uh, investing in education at various levels, I mean, trying to, uh, to educate uh, public administrations, institutions, but also all the way down to primary school uh, pupils, who really uh, should become data citizens uh, from the very start. And uh, in that respect, a space like this is, is crucial to, of course, create, I mean, the privacy camp to create um, a community around that because this is not something that any of us can do alone. Thank you for the thank audience for participating. Awesome. And uh, thank you, Imge, for putting us together. It's been Thanks very really much nice to reconnect with Svani and Mirko and Jonathan. Thanks so much for accepting to join.
and I, I, I don't know if Jonathan can make some final remarks because uh, our remote call setup is really bad. Uh, yes. Ah, okay, cool. I can hear you much better now. I was going to say there's so many things that have been raised uh, in the course of the discussion. I guess uh, just a few uh, sort of takeaway points. One is um, I find it interesting how uh, sort of data politics will kind of uh, evolve as it becomes clear that data is no longer. Yeah. They just become involved in many other issues, how Apple and regulation of academics change. And indeed, how would comp change? I guess the other thing that I've mentioned is uh, how is it possible to experiment driven by very particular kinds of experiments which we see, for example, on large technology platforms such as Facebook? So, so how to uh, politicize the experiment here? Yes, the, the connection, Jonathan, the connection is very poor, so I, I'm really sorry about this. Uh, thanks so much for joining. Thanks a lot. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, everyone, for coming, joining our panel.